Thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Aaron Melman, Director of Marketing for Aiden Technologies. Before we jump into our discussion today about how organizations can get closer to zero trust using emerging technologies like AI, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Aiden. Aiden is automating patch management and software deployment to create better security posture for customers. We're focused on helping to bridge the gap between IT and cybersecurity so that people and businesses function flawlessly. If you'd like to learn more about Aiden and how we can help your organization improve cyber hygiene by decreasing vulnerabilities and allowing IT teams to focus on critical projects, please visit our website, meetain.com, or you can reach out to me directly via email at aaron.melman at meetain.com. And uh, at the end, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes of the discussion for any questions that you might have. So please make sure to post those in the chat and I'll make sure to get our uh, speakers to answer them for you. With that being said, I'm gonna hand it off to John Kinderbog. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us why you're here. Hey, thanks, uh, Aaron. And uh, hey, everybody out in TV land. Uh, uh, nice to be here. We're gonna be talking today about Zero Trust AI. You may know me um, as the guy who created Zero Trust. If, if you're here, you probably have heard of it and wanna know more. So I created Zero Trust when I was at Forrester Research. I did eight and a half years there. I just finished a four year stint at Palo Alto Networks where I was the field CTO, uh, focusing on building zero trust networks for clients. And now I'm a senior vice president at a company called Ontoit, and we deliver zero trust as a service. So it's a managed service. Uh, the, it's a Dutch company and we're moving into the US and I've known those guys for years and years and years. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, I guess, Scott, John, thank you, and uh, Aiden, folks, thank you for having me on. This is uh, such an honor and a privilege. Um, so I'm Scott Shefferman, uh, Principal uh, Strategist at Eclipsium, which is a firmware slash hardware slash network device appliance level of security company. I also have my own LLC called Armanda Intelligence, affectionately named after my great-grandmother. Uh, great story there sometime over a beer. <laughs> so my background is about 20 years doing cybersecurity. Uh, everybody says that when they get on a, on a podcast like these, uh, webinar that, like that these days, but um, 15 of that was spent supporting the warfighter uh, through systems like Spay War and Navy and intelligence communities, uh, doing cybersecurity uh, on everything from submarines to satellites and everything in between, hospitals, you name it. Uh, and then the last seven years or so, I've been in what we call the vendor space, working for companies like FireEye, Silence, uh, Sentinel One, and now Eclipsium doing everything from um, incident response engagements, directing those global type of uh, security assessments, compromise assessments, mergers, acquisitions, CISO 90 day plans, you kind of name it. I've been a consultant for most of my career in the cyberspace. So um, really looking forward to being here. Uh, John, it's a pleasure to be with you, Josh as well. Uh, I think you and I met in Las Vegas a couple of years ago at one of the events that you were at and I was speaking at. So it's, it's great to be back. Thank you, Scott. And thanks, John. Um, first, let me just say I'm honored to be here with both of you, um, two industry luminaries that have done so much in the field uh, to help people. Um, when I set out to launch Aiden, we were really doing it with one big thought in mind, which was how can we help CIOs, CTOs, and CISOs and their teams across the board to feel safer, more secure, and be able to have their users be more productive? Um, AI has been so important to that mission and the concept of zero trust has also been so important to that mission. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my background is predominantly in IT operations. I was a consultant uh, in New York, had my own consulting business for over 25 years called Business Technology Partners. Worked with some of the largest banks and financial services institutions. Um, also worked with healthcare, legal companies, and large accounting companies. And we had an MSP that dealt with small, medium-sized businesses for many years. Uh, so I've seen this, these challenges from kind of every angle, right, from large companies and small. Uh, in 2018, I went to work for what I figured to be my last customer, <laughs> um, Hellman and Friedman, uh, and I spent a couple of years as a CTO in private equity, uh, and I learned a lot there as well, particularly because at that time, not only were we raising a very large fund, uh, but we were, so we were certainly in the limelight a lot, and we were under attack you know, from time to time, of course, like all organizations. Uh, but we also were seeing that the SEC was starting to do major examinations uh, on private equity and alternative investment management businesses. And so that started to really change the landscape. 
and get that entire industry thinking about concepts like zero trust uh, and how to leverage new technologies like AI to fix some of these problems, which is actually where I met my co-founder and then ended up taking this journey um, to build Aiden. Um, so it's, it's been a really great experience. Uh, I'm gonna kick things off uh, with you, John. Um, you are the father of Zero Trust, and you know we know you created it in 2010 as a concept when you were at Forrester. And you know I, I really am fascinated by this notion that you made this huge transition from essentially thought leader, writer, analyst to a practitioner, a leading practitioner in the industry, both with Palo Alto and now in your own cybersecurity consultancy business where you're implementing Zero Trust. Can you tell us about the transition and tell us a little bit, share with everybody, you know, what it's like to go into the practitioner world after spending a long time in the thought leadership world? Well, you know, I, I was a practitioner first. So I was a security engineer, architect, consultant, pen tester, um, network guy, all those kinds of things before I went to Forrester. When I joined Forrester, they said, do you want to be an analyst? I said, sure, what's an analyst, right? So uh, I was always sort of, uh, you know, a, a real life practitioner masquerading as a, an analyst. And I think that gave me a huge advantage. And all the people that we brought in after me were not, you know, professional thought leaders the way the analyst business had been. They were practitioners applying that and helping explain what's going on. And so I really started that trend at Forster and I was really proud of, of what it became. Uh, but what you do is you create an idea, but then you have to prove that the idea is, is doable. And so that's why I went to Palo Alto Networks because, well, they have great technology, but also they were the first company who really understood what I was trying to do and supported me. And so I built a lot of stuff originally on their backbone. And then at, at some point, I needed to make it more easy to consume. So that's why I went over to onto it to deliver it as a managed service. So just yesterday, we announced Zero Trust as a service, Z-T-A-A-S, right? So that it's easy to consume. So that's part of the journey. When you have an idea, what is that journey going to be, right? Because you just, I think too many times people uh, have great ideas, but they leave the idea on the table and don't take it through its entire life cycle. And so that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and uh, zero trust has become such a big buzzword that, you know, I've lost, I don't have any control over it, but at the same time, that's incredibly gratifying because, you know, it's so many people are talking about it. So many people are doing things related to it at different levels. And then so many people are employed by it. I've had people walk up to me on airplanes and go, Hey, thanks. I have a job because of you. And if nothing else, you know, that just like sends chills down your spine when somebody tells you something like that. So, um, but, at the, but there's still more work to do because there's uh, really, you know, bad attackers out there and, and, you know, you guys in vulnerability management or in patch management, I've always said trust is a vulnerability. So I'm trying to eliminate that. And how do we do that in the most automated way, right? And that's where these concepts of AI and machine learning, although we should have a discussion, are they different or are they the same? How do we consume all these things? Because zero trust is a strategy that consumes technologies like yours, Joshua. So it, it, it's, it's decoupled from technology and, uh, and technology is always gonna change. It's always gonna get better but we have to have a strategy moving forward. And that's what a lot of people have really gravitated towards Zero Trust because it gives them a vision or strategy that they can then move towards. Very interesting. And I mean, I guess I would bring this over to you, Scott. You know, John talked about how Zero Trust is really abstracted from the technology. What does Zero Trust mean to you, Scott? I mean, when you're out there in the front lines working with clients, I know you're called in on several of these major ransomware attacks and things like that to consult with and help customers get an understanding of what it is they should be doing. What does this really mean to you out there in the field? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I won't make any bones about it. It's, for me, it's very personal. Um, so I, I got into this industry hardcore after 9-11 happened and, uh, and I stayed in that field supporting government warfighter for 15, 16 years. Uh, and, and Josh, you and I talked about that. So when I wake up on a, in, out of the bed every morning, I'm here to fight the bad guys, whoever they are, and protect the homeland, if that makes sense, right? So lack of better words. So 15, 16 years supporting the warfighter, but in 2012, something interesting happened when the Iranians hacked the NMCI, that's public knowledge event, 
and it threw me for a loop because as much money, hundreds of millions we had spent on security, what were considered the least sophisticated APT actors back then, the Iranians, completely compromised a very large network, <laughs> a million devices plus. And for me, that shocked me. So I figured out what they did. They, they were using callbacks that we couldn't see. They had ways to move about the network that we weren't tooled for, that our requirements were asking us to do and look for with technology. So I went to work for FireEye because they could see callback technology. And you fast forward that through my career on the vendor side since that moment, uh, when I found out you know, I was, we were pregnant with my now daughter, my, my mission came to protect the homeland. So you know, FireEye helped me see, understand callback detection and, and detonation chambers. Uh, Silence helped me see and understand predictive AI, the ability to predict malware years before it was even written or conceived by the bad guys, which is a mind blowing concept to this day, but the power of a narrow AI. And that's when I coined that term temporal predictive advantage to describe the advantage that AI has over the bad guys, over an entire economy of thousands of bad guys. So, I, you know, continues forward today. Here I am at Eclipsium because why? Because the bad guys are going down low to the hardware, to the device, which is the center of trust. It's the foundation of trust itself. And when we're talking about zero trust and automation, I think we'd be remiss not to talk about the fact that if you can't trust your device at the hardware firmware layer or supply chain layer, you have bigger problems all of a sudden, right? So um, that's a kind of a long way to answer the question. But to me, zero trust uh, being here, um, it's, it's, it's still personal. <laughs> I still want to win. I still want to protect my daughter's future. Uh, I mean, and, and these are great things. I mean, you know, you and I shared that in common, Scott, right? Talking about how we care deeply about protecting our families and the country around us and the people that we work with. Um, you know, I think that it's very interesting. We have the zero trust framework. We have had it for now over a decade since John came up with the concept in 2010. We also have AI tools, 28, right? 28. You talked about 2008. Scott. Oh, 2008. So just to remember, there's two <laughs> years of research behind this before you write the paper. Sure. So th these things, I mean, a lot of people can write a blog post and then, oh, I could, but when you have rigorous research, that's the difference of why Zero Trust took off because I spent two years making sure that there weren't holes in it. And that's what people don't realize, you know, and uh, so it's been a much longer journey than it looks to other people. So, right. Just, but out, just out to, in the to, world, to, right. To be, and I appreciate that. Yeah, very much, yeah. But out in the world, we've been talking about it since you launched it in industry, right? And, and, and I guess yeah. what I'm saying is we have all these AI tools out there. Um, one that I'm working with today included, right? And yet... You look in the media, and I'm waking up every day and reading the headlines like everybody else, right? In the last, I think, less than six weeks, Colonial Pipeline, Cox Media, right? JBS, CNA Financial, all paying large ransoms or talking about paying large ransoms, right? And we just keep getting hit over and over again. So, so my question, and maybe, John, you'd like to take this one first, is, do we think that AI can play a role in predicting not just the next malware, but where the next attack is likely to happen and lead us to a solution as practitioners where we can get involved and help those companies faster? And John, I'd, I'd love to know if you've seen anything like this or how and when we think this is going to start to happen. If you look at the difference between kinetic warfare and cyber warfare, the big difference is accessibility, right? It's it, the nature of imminence. So in, in, a, in a kinetic war, like you, you look at the first Gulf War, we saw that, that Saddam Hussein was putting troops on the border of Kuwait. Everybody knew he was going to attack Kuwait, but you just couldn't unilaterally bomb the heck out of, you know, the, uh, the Iraqi army to, to preempt the war. But um, in cybersecurity, you're directly, or you're always directly connected to the world's worst bad guy. So they have, they have the, the connectivity to you. They have the accessibility. They have the tools and techniques. So the only thing that's keeping them from attacking you is the will to attack you. So I would argue that it's kind of a Schrodinger's <laughs> cat problem. You're going to get attacked by a bad guy, uh, both, you know, zero and 100%. It, it could be either, either or, right? Uh, both states exist always at the same time, and you can't control that malicious actor on 
if and when they're going to attack you. What you can control is whether or not the attack is going to be successful. So we talk about attacks versus successful attacks. I'm, I, I don't, you know, we can't worry about all the attacks in the world because there's too many. That's why I don't worry about attack surfaces. I worry about protect surfaces and invert these things. And I want to stop successful attacks, not every attack, because I can't control those. Maybe some nation state can do that. Maybe, you know, you could have what people call offensive security and attack an attacker before they have the ability to attack and preempt it. But for my clients who are primarily uh, corporations and in, in the private sector, they can't do that. That would be illegal. And so and they shouldn't try to do that. So what they should do is stop successful attacks from being successful, either being disruptive or especially uh, stealing data. Uh, data exfiltration, I say, is the grand strategy of zero trust. You have to have a grand strategic um, view of the world. And the grand strategy is stopping data breaches. And if you can do that, then you can stop all this other stuff that's going on. Because why, does ran how, how, why is ransomware successful? Well, you know, patching, people don't patch, right? Uh, people don't do good backups and people allow command and control traffic to leave, uh, leave their environment and connect to something on the public internet and send a symmetric key back. And all those three things are, are solvable problems. It's just that corporations don't typically have the will to solve them. And that's why I worked on Zero Trust was to, get, to change the incentives internally so that executives would, would incentivize the technical people to do the right thing because the average corporation has a very 20th century view of cybersecurity. And that's the reason they're being hacked, right? They have very traditional methods, very traditional tools, very traditional architectures. They, they have flat networks that give, once the attacker has purchased, they have access to everything and they get to be on there for a long time, right? So, um, but we, we want to, uh, we want to protect, we want to prevent the successful attack against a particular resource. And so in zero trust, that's why I've been focusing so much about the concept of a protect surface, invert the attack surface, shrink it down really small orders of magnitude to something that is, that is tiny and easily knowable. I learned how to do this because I'm, I, I did QSA work. So uh, all we had to protect in, in, in a PCI domain was the cardholder data, the PAN. Once we did that, that was the limit of the scope. And, and that taught me how to protect a single binary data string. And so you need to break everything down into small solvable chunks. Otherwise, if you do the, I found a problem, buy a technology, uh, implement the technology, find another problem, do that over and over again, you will run out of money before you run out of problems. So you have to break this down into manageable chunks. And most organizations don't do that. That it's would be a great, It's a great point, John. And I, I do see how zero trust over the years has absolutely been a framework to help reduce risk uh, for organizations and shrink it down, as you pointed out. And, and also how you know, you're effectively able to obscure things a little bit better through that. But when I think about what's just happened, right? They've now attacked our energy supply. They've brought the fight onto our turf. They've attacked our media. They've attacked our meat and our food supply. And they've attacked our financial institutions. And I don't care how much you shrink down the corporate network, they know what they're after. They're after what everybody is now deeming sicky, right? Our systematically important critical infrastructure. They are going after us on our turf. And so Scott, with all your work in protecting the warfighter, abroad mostly, and as John even talked about, right, these fights, kinetic ones versus, you know, cybersecurity, terrorism, right? But that was abroad. This is a fight on our homeland, right? It's happening on our country every day. And I guess what I would like to know, Scott, is what are you seeing out there when you're working with customers? What new tools, because John was absolutely right, right? The average organization is working on 20th century technologies. Yeah. So, Help us understand better what can people be doing because no matter how much they shrink the aperture, these attackers know exactly what they're after. And those critical infrastructure organizations need to figure out how they're gonna use modern technology to protect themselves. 
I'd like to hear your perspective on that. What are you seeing every day? This is one of those questions. It's like if you're in a baseball game and somebody throws you the perfect pitch and you know it's going to be a home run before you even swing the ball. Like, I'm so amped up to answer this question, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, so let me do my best. I'll tell you what I feel like the most important advantage is no matter what in any context when it comes to cyber. And it's this thing that's invisible, that everybody forgets to measure, that nobody actually holds as a benchmark, that the attackers take full advantage of every time. And that is time itself. And what, when we talk about AI and we talk about things that can actually win this battle on the homeland like you're talking about or in your own enterprise, the first thing you have to realize is that it takes an attitude shift. I'm not going to spend time here, but I, I do a lot of talking on leadership and on the idea that if we keep telling ourselves it's a matter of if and when, or, uh, but, or we, we assume the breach too often, and when those kind of thoughts start to inform our strategy, we start to fail in our strategy and how we spend and how we resource and how we fight the problem because we're not leaning forward to solve and be creative and actually think outside the box and win. So you have a domain here inside your enterprise that is yours. It is way more complex, more sophisticated, better tooled and more resourced than what the bad guys have. People don't think of it that way, but it is. It's your domain. Think about like being a Linux admin in 1989 or 90 or something. You're like, this is my domain. I know when an anomaly happens. I know who my users are. I know what my ingress egress is. I know my ports, protocols, and services. All these things you know on an admin level, you need to apply to the enterprise. So when you own your domain, if you do a better job at getting faster at doing the things you already know how to do, you can start to actually win. And you know, doing all these instant responses and you do a hot wash after every single one and root cause analysis, and you step back and you say, what can we make sure does, so this doesn't happen again? That's what the board wants to know. That's the executive summer I used to prepare, right? The answer is we had the visibility nine times out of 10. We had the right logging. We had the right tooling. We bought all the stuff. We even had the right resources and skills and aptitudes. What we didn't have is a better measurement of getting faster at operationalizing these things. So when it comes to um, and getting ahead of the attacker, because it's a race against time right now with EDR and XDR play, SIM, SOAR, all the threat intelligence, all the enrichment we're doing in the cloud and we're keep building up this stack. What we're doing is putting time pressure on the bad guy. We're winning some of that fight. They don't have a 450 day dwell time like they did in 2015. They have something less than hundred days. It's still a long time, but there are attacks now that can play out in a matter of minutes, right? And there's automation involved in those attacks and there's scalability. And there's liquidity in the malware economy. It lets any actor get a VPN vulnerability the same time he's getting an RDP vulnerability. And, and they can get in a five different ways if they want to target an organization at any given Sunday, right? So speed matters is what I'm trying to say. And so when it comes to AI, I have a single litmus. And I can give you two examples too, if you want. The litmus is, is my solution or my machine learning allowing me to make a decision that matters fast enough to be in front of that decision to actually interject that kill chain? Is it moving, am I empowered to make that decision as a human fast enough to matter in terms of interrupting a kill chain or an attack chain that's actually underway inside the environment, right? If you, if you assume the initial breach, VPN, Spearfish, whatever, then there's this race against time. And you have to ask yourself and measure how well you're doing against the adversary at every given junction of that kill chain. And this is why AI matters, because AI can allow us to make those decisions. It can automate the ones that we don't need a human in the loop for. And then where you need a human in the loop, it can present that and explain itself these days better than it's ever been able to do before. We're in a renaissance of explainable AI. We're right in the precipice of understanding that I can trust this thing and make a decision that's not going to hurt me. That's a low risk decision in making it. It's a high confidence decision. And I can actually do something that matters because most of what we spend our time doing is not being done fast enough to matter. It's being done because of compliance or business drivers, or, or because you have, like John said, you bought too many things, you have too much noise, you're doing all these things you calling, you're calling it low hanging fruit. The actor doesn't care what you call it. The actor just cares about what they need to do on their kill chain to get through. And so we're, we just have yeah, to readjust. You know, <laughs> you know uh, uh, one of my favorite cyber movies isn't a cyber movie. It's, it's, uh, the imitation game about breaking the Nazi Enigma code. We mm -hmm. talked about this in our pre-call, but I love that movie as an example of where we need to go because in the movie, Alan Turing is building, building that analog computer called the Bomba, 
uh, and everybody wants to tear that down. There's actually a scene where they try to tear it down because they want more of the three P's of crypto analysis, people, pencils and paper. Right. And he says in the movie, only what if only a machine can defeat another machine? And that's where we're at. We have to do that. I mean, I'm doing that on a daily basis and you're doing that. And we understand the value of that. Right. Um, I'm not worried about intrusions. Right. So I, I make a distinction about intrusions versus breaches. Breaches is when the, the bad thing happens that gets out or that that that, uh, you know, data is stolen. Intrusions. There's going to be lots and lots of intrusions. But did they get to something that mattered? Right. Did they get to that critical infrastructure? Did they get to that's the whole concept of a protect surface? Oh, they stole my my public documents that I want have on the Web. Who cares? Right. So we have to say that everything isn't equal in terms of of the asset value or the data value. And then we have to understand that uh, they have so many ways to to come in and really where the kill chain, where I think the kill chain gets interesting is the actions on objectives. And that's where I want to focus because, uh, you know, that's where I can really make a difference from from an automation perspective because I can can contextualize data and actually automate it. I wrote a paper years ago called Rules of Engagement that talked about that. And that's actually implemented into our technology. But all these things, AI, machine learning, whatever we call them, again, it has to be automated. That, let's get down to it. It has to be automated because we can't ever be as fast as they have. Some of those attacks, I've seen a couple of them that take seconds. So you can't even process the attack before the attacker is already gone. So how, how do you do that? Well, you have to have machines to do it. And that's, I mean, that's just where it's going to go. And it's not going to put anybody out of business they're, they're in, in terms of jobs. You know, you're not going to lose your job to a machine in cybersecurity because there's so much need for good people. You're just going to quit doing the boring stuff. Yeah. And that's, so, that's something I spend a lot of time trying to convince people of, right? We're, we're not replacing human engineers with the AI technology. What we are doing is enabling them to focus on the high value initiatives and the higher profile stuff within their organizations and actually work with users and spend more time care and feeding, figuring out what people's real needs are and listening. Josh, I, I, I was remiss in not answering your question, which was, give me an example, right? Tell me, tell me how can you, can we get to a point where we can predict an attack? And I will tell you where I think that's gonna happen next. Right. And, and, and realistically, so not pipe dream stuff, you know, Futurama stuff, but literally there's, there's a lot of threat intelligence platforms in out there. And when you talk about threat intelligence, there's a thousand different definitions and use cases, but one in particular is one that looks to the deep dark web uh, close enough to actually see what, and actually a command uh, control structure of the bad guys to see, okay, the initial droppers are in place like, on this vertical, a ransomware campaign about to hit finance is about to hit. It's, it could be five days or a week or two weeks, maybe at the most, that you can have that anticipation. And that intelligence is there, but it, uh, it takes, nowadays it takes human vetting, some automation, but it takes a lot of vetting to get to that level of understanding and seeing into that C2 infrastructure to know that, let's say, Drydex is about to hit the financial industry uh, sometime in the next week. And that's actually a real example that I can't speak too much about, but Drydex is on, on a good one right now. Um, you know, there, these VPN vulnerabilities, when these VPN vulnerabilities come out and there's a zero day hitting, you have about two days to two weeks. I know that window by heart. I know it across the last 173 CVEs over the last 10 years of every single VPN appliance. That's how many there are, these vulnerabilities. And that window gets smaller and smaller. When credentials are leaked, it's a matter of 12 hours. A study just yesterday, and I, I wish I could remember who did it. They, they seeded the dark web with their own credentials, unique credentials. They waited to see how long those credentials would be used. The average was 12 hours. Some of 40% of them were used within an hour. So when you lose your credentials, how fast, again, back to speed, can you actually say, I need to reset that account, or I need to watch out for this VPN appliance and logging coming in with those credentials that are, are known leaked? So pulling intelligence out off the ground, like boots on the ground, so to speak, from the deep dark web and from C2 infrastructure is one way to actually get ahead of really bad events, which is what John's talking about, the, the actual bad thing that happens when the actor turns the encryption on across hundreds of devices in your network. That's when the really bad stuff happens. That's when entropy starts to happen, fog of war, and, in, and many different forms of impact, not just backups and sensitive data, but all sorts of impact happens to the organization. If you can get ahead of that, 
Let's do it. So let's figure out how to automate that. Let's figure out how to take that information from one person and scale it to an entire vertical. So Scott, I mean, that is great. And you're seeing examples in the field of huge leaps forward, right? That AI is now being used in threat intelligence, threat hunting, really trying to predict where things are happening. Um, now to bring it back a little bit more to the core of the topic at hand, which is, John, maybe you could give us some examples. How are you starting to see AI used in implementing or achieving zero trust for organizations that want to protect the, the house and want to protect the crown jewels? Like the technology that, that, that the co-founder of the company I'm at now built called EventFlow does all that because it, it it takes these paradigms of log management and SIM, SOAR, uh, analytics, puts them together in a custom way, gives a lot of context against what's being attacked. And so in our world, in the world that I'm in now, only about one in every 100,000 events has to be looked at by a human. The rest of them can be managed by, by the, the platform, by the machine itself. And the more uh events that we see over time the fewer things that have to be uh, looked at by a human being so that's that's building on the idea of anti-fragility from taleb so as you get more data you have more knowledge and and you you know some people call that training the machine for machine learning i don't know that all those those metaphors really work particularly well but it does make the machine more useful and better and more accurate and and this is what's happening in the world is that we're all moving towards this realm of automation if you're doing it manually you are automatically going to be too slow just by the fact that hackers don't have change control right so all the things that scott talked about are are cool except that every company has uh, uh processes in place because they're worried about breaking something so they have change control and that change control process when you get down to it is really slow and, and it's much slower than the attacker and it's probably slower than the dwell time that they're that they need to be in to achieve their objective and so we have to automate out of those paradigms the other thing that's that's killing us is we're so afraid of false positive that will false positives that will a lot of allow a lot of bad things to come into our environment because we're afraid we might stop that one good thing. What if we stop that one good thing? Oh, no, I might get fired because I stopped the president's email. Who cares? You shouldn't care about that stuff. You should make sure you know everything that's going on in your environment. The idea of unknown traffic drives me crazy. And when I've been looking at people's environments, what is that traffic? We don't know. Well, then why are you letting it in? Well, it might be good. Well, then that paradigm itself is the problem. You don't do that at home. Right. You know, you don't have a you don't have a Super Bowl party and you 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 have somebody come in and you go, I don't know who that is. Do you know who that is? No, but they're getting beer out of the fridge. I guess they belong here. Let's make up the guest room. We don't do that in real life. Why would we do that in our network? But we do it all the day, all the time, because there's perverse incentives in place that say if you stop something good, we're going to you know, you're going to get in trouble. But if you stop something bad you're not no one's going to ever acknowledge that and until we change those incentives we're never going to change the fundamental problem yep. incentives is a really good point also the last time we had a conversation like this with some thought leaders somebody brought up the point that cyber insurance industry is creating almost more of a problem in that they will often want to fund the ransom more so than the cost of doing the remediation and actually building the more zero trust highly resilient and highly effective network strategy, right? So um, that's not helping. And then of course, we're just funding the attackers to be more enabled to do these attacks on us and perpetrate more offenses. Um, you know, I, I saw something the other day that the cyber insurance market is growing by 21% year over year, expected to reach 20 billion by 2025. And I took note of this. Yet every insurance industry expert is talking about the fact that they're literally guessing at policy limits and premium costs because they don't really have the data to know how secure or how risk, you know, how much risk is involved in any one of the companies that their organizations they're under. And I guess I'd, I'd put this out to you, Scott, first, right? You talked about AI 
being able to accelerate time, right? And we've talked about AI being able to predict maybe where things are gonna happen next. Do you see a way in which AI can help us identify quickly where there are gaps in the security framework or the security architecture of a particular company? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, AI, being that it doesn't sleep, being that it likes really, really big numbers and complex things better than any one human usually is able to uh, understand and make decisions from, it has a number of advantages like this, right? Speed, accuracy. Um, one, one of the ways you apply AI because of those attributes is to say, okay, I have a, a lot of data. Everybody's got a lot of data these days coming from all sorts of sensors everywhere. And you can let the data find the data, kind of a hybrid analytic approach, but you can also do better than that. You can, if you have expertise, you can guide the AI in a way that lets you say, look, um, let's say I have 5,000 devices and they're all of the same model. But on day 63, after acquiring all these and procuring them, um, 50 of them have shifted fundamentally at the device integrity level. And if you didn't take that action, and if you don't know, didn't, don't know that you took that action, you might have a problem, right? Now, is that a security problem? Is there malicious intent in there? Do you have a threat uh, underway, a risk about to materialize? You might not know, but one of the things that AI does better than any human possibly can, or even a human team can, is solve for these kind of large, large data set issues that are complex. Um, it's the true of software, it's true of device integrity, it's true of identity. Somebody was talking about two-factor authentication and the questions there, and you know that mean, needs to be necessary. Yes, the two-factor authentication, the way it's implemented probably half the time is completely broken and very susceptible to a number of attacks that any attacker targeting the organization can easily bypass. End of story. How do you get better than that? Well, it, there comes AI. You can do things like understand a human or a machine as it moves through space and time, doing the things it does, understanding its metadata coming off of that entity, and understanding that continuously it is what it says it is. So if we don't get to a place where we have continuous authentica authentication and, there, and therefore authorization to do the things the entity is doing, we'll never win that war. We will always be at a snapshot in time version of authentication, and that's failing whether it's two-factor, multi-factor, any number of factors. So we need this continuous ability to do that. Only AI can do that. Only AI can understand we as humans and identities uh, in ways for which humans don't even have language for. <laughs> Only AI can work around probabilities in ways that humans can learn to accept because via induction over the course of a year, I observe test data and I know that it's 97% efficacy, you know, very low false positives. Okay, now I'm going to relinquish to this AI. But AI, you know, trust with AI, let's talk about zero trust, like trust of AI is a two-way street. Humans need to be able to trust through a generational, uh, incremental kind of development of an AI project all the way to the end and take risks in that process. Humans have to be able to say, I'm going to relinquish some of my control. I don't, I might not understand the impacts here. I might make a boo-boo and people might get mad at me, but you have to start taking these risks and being able to um, uh, bring the company along, the organization along with you that this is the risk we're taking, but this is why we're taking the risk. And this is the expected outcome a year from now. Yeah, we get this all the time. What if you're, what if the AI makes a mistake, right? Or what if the AI does something well, wrong? The benefits yeah, typically I mean, outweigh the risks already, and it's getting more and more so. But to your point, Scott, people have to take those risks. Yeah. Um, John, I do want to bring this over to you. Somebody put something interesting in the comments, and I, I want to read it uh, because it's, it's pretty interesting. It says it takes, it takes at its core simple best practices. We're not even getting least privilege. Diligent patching, which, as you know, I'm asking. The separation of duties right, and separation of duties or micro segmentation. This is why nearly all these exploits have happened in reality. Zero trust is an excellent methodology. These data custodians aren't even nearly on the basis. They're on the basis. So in your mind, are there opportunities here for AI to help them get there on the basis? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, and this is, this is the problem because we have, human modalities that we're trying to transfer into digital systems that will never work. Risk is one of them, right? I don't think we can ever have real risk. You can't, why is cyber insurance so hard to do? Cause you can never build an actuarial table on cyber, right? To, to completely misappropriate 
a, a quote from Taleb. We don't know how many sides the die has that's being cast. So how could we ever define a probability statement or a risk statement? I, I like to say that risk is danger and we need to mitigate dangerous things. Uh, but people will people still think that they can do the same thing in in uh, human in digital world that they can do in human world, which is uh, they can transfer a risk to somebody else. But that doesn't work because compliance won't allow it to happen. They can accept a risk, but that's too dangerous or they can mitigate a risk. But if that costs money, then I don't want to do it because I really don't care. And my risk management people say that that would never happen anyway, but no one knows. So ultimately, we have to get to where all risks or dangerous things are mitigated and we have to have confidence. That's why I don't like the trust word, the T word, right? It's a four letter word in my vocabulary, Scott. We have to have confidence that the system is doing better. The problem is human beings, if, if Scott or John make a boo-boo, oh, they're just human. We have that saying, right, in our vocabulary, they're just human. If a machine doesn't do exactly what you expect it to, tear that thing up, throw the computer against the wall, right? That It's broken. It doesn't know what I want. It, and we think it's supposed to have intuition, like to know what we want. How many times were you ever frustrated by some friend or relative who this computer doesn't work the way I think it should. Well, it's only doing what you tell it to do. And that's true in AI as well, right? So the, 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 the problem is people want to throw it up against the wall when it doesn't do exactly what they think it should. And they aren't learning from the things that it's telling them. And so, yes, it's going to be much better at knowing things. It's much better at crunching numbers. It's much better at doing things Will it be predictive in the way that we think from TV shows like or movies like Minority Report? I don't think so, right? Because we don't control uh, the actions of the attacker. But can we know that, you know, all the known cyber attacks aren't won't be able to be, uh, you know, used against a particular resource? That's something that's knowable. So we want to take the things that are possibly known and, and use those to reduce the amount of, of things because things that could go wrong, because as one friend of mine who is in, you know, the kind of business you used to be in, Scott said, attackers don't attack well-defended environments because they have to make money. They've got a return on investment. Richard Bate used to talk about creating enough friction uh, to make them go somewhere else. And, and, and there's certain nation state attacks where that's not true, right? But for the most part, somebody wants to make some money. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, make it harder for them to make money and maybe they'll go on to the next victim. John, that, that's an excellent point. And actually one, one of our advisors uh, and investors, Richard Clark was on, interviewed on CNN last week. And, and I heard him say his top recommendation was and it wouldn't take much for the White House to do it. it could be an executive order or otherwise, but you know, pay, make paying these ransoms illegal, right? I, I don't know, I see Scott shaking his head, so maybe this is an interesting one to debate, uh, but it strikes me that if you made paying these ransoms illegal, people would have a hell of a lot more incentive to, to actually embrace some of these new technologies uh, and, and spend money fixing their environments rather than just thinking if something happens, they could pay the ransom if they need to, uh, and that they have enough cyber liability insurance coverage to, you know, to kind of the CFO looking at that strategy, right? Or are we are we in a position? And then it also strikes me that if you look at the market well, cap, what, as someone else pointed out, of all these companies, after a ransomware attack, whether they paid the ransom or they didn't, usually within six months, they've recovered at least 50% of their market cap. Anthony Johnson on our last call talked about how he has a group of CISOs that just wait for that to happen and then invest. So, you know, there's two factors going on. You use the word trust, right, as a four-letter word, John, and Scott likes the word, but whether we call it confidence or trust, we keep being afraid of what's happening, almost like the other movie that you didn't mention, which is Terminator, where, in my mind, I remember that scene from Terminator where Skynet becomes aware, right? And everybody maybe is a little afraid of the computer getting too smart, computers building or fixing other machines, which is what we're after. But... What is it that we have to do, right? If we don't like Dick's recommendation, 
to Scott, and I'll bring this back to you, right, to, to make paying these ransoms illegal, then what is it that we have to do to get companies to have confidence or place confidence in more frequently newer and modern technologies to protect their organizations, um, not just companies, organizations, nation states, government agencies, whatever it may be. How do we get people to embrace these new technologies? Yeah, it's, it's good. A uh, couple parts there. Um, you bring up a good point about offset. So if you pay the ransom, there goes $10 million, $50 million, $100,000 that you could have put towards tech. Uh, it's a good point. And you gave to the bad guys and they just got stronger. So that's the primary argument there is don't give it to them because it just builds up their their, their whole uh, incentive and infrastructure. However, um, th th if you need to regulate this, I agree that somebody in the comments said the same thing. But when it comes to actually being in the trenches, when it's actually you making the decision to pay a ransom or not, you're the CEO of Colonial Pipeline or of uh, UBS in Brazil, like uh, JBS. The thing is, uh, you don't know until you're in there. And no team ransom situations are the same. And when you have any, I mean, classic example, obviously, is when I worked with all the hospitals that were getting hit by Sam Sam, which is Iranian actors in 2015, 2016. That was really, really bad. That's the first time you saw patient life really kind of being jeopardized, right? But it's true in manufacturing. It's true in mission operations. It's true in maritime operations. It's true in oil and gas. It's true in operational environments that safety, whether it's to the public, like in Colonial Pipeline potentially, or to workers or to patients, is always the most important thing. And it, you know, you, you, nobody wants to pay that ransom. Not a single victim ever wants to make that ransom. But these actors are extremely adept at hitting you in many different ways when they hit you. It's not just, if you don't pay the ransom, we won't give you the key. That's so 2014, okay? This is 2021. It's a whole nother ball game. And these victims are getting crushed a thousand different ways, not just one or two, right? It's affecting their supply chain, both upstream and downstream, their third parties. Um, they're, they're holding uh, personal information on all the executives and hitting up independently on the phone call, making threats to family and friends. They're, they're doing all sorts of tactics that you don't get to read about in the newspaper because you're not on the front lines, right? We get to see the abstracted pro version of this problem. The reality is if there needs to be regulation, I, which I agree there needs to be, needs to be in the form of having organizations be transparent and reporting to a central place so we can all get smarter and identify and attribute these actions so we can get these bad guys and apprehend them. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay those ransoms when safety, uh, uptime, or public safety or critical infrastructure uh, needs, to, needs to keep the lights on, right? Um, and, and I would argue too, I have opinions here. They're not necessarily, uh, they're not controversial, but they're debatable, I should say. When you pay in Bitcoin like Colonial Pipeline did, you have a good chance you can get that money back. All you need is the private key. And all you need is a, a, a warrant or some ability to get that private key off of the bad guy's infrastructure or compute device, which is often where these Darwinian criminals leave the private keys. That's why they got the uh, part, part of the money back with Colonial Pipeline because they played in Bit Bitcoin, which has a ledger. If these same groups are all fraudsters originally, they're all the financial groups. They're good at mules and money laundering and, and, and uh, uh, um, ATMs and, and all sorts of other ways to extract money, um, money wires, you name it. There's lots of ways to get money out of an organization. But the impact to an organization is just so much broader and nuanced than I think most people understand. Well, I, I think if there's premeditated thought into using the ransom as a way to track the, the perpetrators and get the ransom back, I, now I'm much more in agreement with you, Scott. I, I personally, though, do feel that paying ransoms is only, there may be some really significant blows we will suffer if we don't pay ransoms. But until, in my view, uh, I have to agree with Dick on this one, until we stop paying ransoms, we're just enabling this. It's like, don't negotiate with terrorists, right? Yeah. We, we, we just don't. Well, it's one thing right? if- Because you, otherwise we right. just encourage the next problem. But, but that's fine when you're sitting back in Richard Clark's position, but when it's your kid, who's been kidnapped, then you want to negotiate with the terrorists. Of course. Right? And that's what so, it feels like. Which is why people say we need regulation because no one's going to, in the moment of crisis, when their entire balance sheet is, when their shareholders' profits are on the line or whatever else it is, or their kids, going to say, I don't want to pay the ransom. That's why we're talking about adding regulations. And, and I believe that whatever it is, whether it's regulatory, or it's some other kind of incentive-based compensation for doing better, right? Like in, in the healthcare world, somebody in the panel on the comments brought this up. 
we had a program called Meaningful Use. I was a CIO in healthcare for seven years. Meaningful Use was the federal government giving grant money to organizations, not just to put in electronic health records and integrate them with each other, but to use it meaningfully, not just to do it, but demonstrate you're actually doing it well. So I could see some kind of regulatory um, and you know, incentive program around giving organizations, both public ones, but also private sector, and I think this is where public and private sector need to work together more, incentive dollars to be able to go out and finally put these modern technologies in and actually bring their networks from the 20th century into the 21st century and beyond. Um, I, I don't wait, wait, know wait. that enough companies are going to do this proactively with the way that things, the way the deck is stacked now with cyber insurance liability yeah. companies encouraging them to pay ransom. But Joshua, here's the problem, right? First of all, I know you're new to Texas, but we Texans, we don't like regulations. So you're going to have to learn to hate regulations as much. But these regulations always backfire. There's enough money. It's just they're not willing to spend the money. And somebody made that in the comment. The ransom is more than the security budget often. And that's the problem. And so we don't need the government giving tax dollars to companies to do the right thing. That's certainly not good. Um, and, and we don't need more regulations because there's too many regulations and they overlap and they compete and all security officers do is spend their time filling out paperwork. We need a different set of incentives. The best incentive is to make, you know, file lawsuits, class action lawsuits and get CEOs fired and board members fired if there's these kinds of events, because then they'll take it seriously. And, and that was what the value of the target breach was. The target breach was the most significant uh, action that ever happened in cybersecurity, in my opinion, because the CEO got fired because of something IT either didn't do, which was allow a data breach. And so, uh, but people don't take cybersecurity seriously if it costs money. And we have to solve that problem. It is the most important thing that you're spending money on probably and you don't get it you don't get it because you don't if you're an airplane if you're a, a, a airline if if your computer system doesn't go on work doesn't matter if the pilots are there the plane is there the passengers are there plane doesn't get off the ground sorry so people have this 20th century view that um it and cybersecurity are inhibitors of the business they're just overhead they don't grow the business. That's complete and utter nonsense in the modern world. They are the foundation to the business. Until you understand that as a leader, then you will always have these problems. Best, best book on that, John, uh, I could not agree more, is, is by my, my most important mentor in this industry, Malcolm Harkins, wrote a book called Protect to Enable, which is literally speaks to everything you just articulated so well, which is how to actually be a leader inside the organization to view security as ROI uh, and, and, and much more beyond um, to enable the entire business to succeed. It's so awesome. Scott, what do, we, what do we do if our leaders are actually doing a pretty good job and the company gets a hack anyway? Well, what do we, so what, so if we extract this too much, we'll be at the policy level again, but I do believe what we do need to do is have a way to automate and centrally report uh, sufficiently sanitized data to a central organization, government or a partnership with private industry to understand these, the, the telemetry coming off of all these victims and be able to better attribute with higher confidence those actors and those nation states that are harboring those, those activities. Uh, and, you know, I don't need to mince words. Russia harbors, looks the other way and even sponsors a tremendous number of the activities that come at uh, come at the West, or come at us in, in America, and unless we have an international pressure, uh, put international pressure on Russia to say no, we need to be able to apprehend these folks. We have high confidence attribution. We know who the belly button is. Uh, extradite them. You know, until we kind of get there, we're really going to be the bad guys. Will always, like John was saying, they always have leverage. There's always a way in. There's always a way to twist somebody and hurt somebody digitally from afar if you're being protected. And that's the root problem. Um, I do agree with John that incentives, but um, legal uh, for executives that fail to do due, due, due diligence is important. 
Um, but that's a very gray area. And my, my fear there is that the, the legal landscape will be so slow to catch on to so much nuance and so much vocabulary and so much, it's so hard for them to really understand the dynamics of what being responsible actually is. So guys, that's just been my observation. I don't know if I'm right there, but it just, that's my honest fear about it. I'm sorry, I just want to point out, we, have, we only have two minutes left. Okay. Really, two and a half maybe. And I want to save a minute for each of you to answer one final or give your perspective on one final comment, which is, you know, and John, I'm going to start with you first and Scott, I'm going to come to you last. What is it? I'm very excited about AI and its opportunity to improve what's going on within these companies to help them get better, to help them build the solutions that humans are taking too long to get to. John, what excites you about the future of AI and zero trust? Well, just the ability to automate at scale to get in front of all this stuff, right? And people use the words shift left all the time, but in the military, that means left of bang, get in front of bang. Bang is the thing that happens that's bad. You want to be left of it, which is before the bang happens. And so, you know, getting in front of, uh, of the bad thing can only be done because you can take massive data sets and analyze them and so the key thing, is, and we had this mantra at Forrester, you have data, you get insights, but you need to take action. And too many people take the AI world, they get the data, the insights, and never take the action. If you aren't taking action, it's not useful. So empower your AI to take automated actions, because in general, the automated action they take is recoverable. A, a, a ransomware attack, a data breach, they're really, well, especially data breaches. Once you've lost the data, it's non-recoverable. You can rebuild it, but the data is gone forever. You can never get it back. You can never eliminate the impact. And yeah, the market will self-correct, but, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a bad thing. That's, that's just Thank an excuse to, to say, <laughs> ah, data breaches aren't a big deal. And, and with a minute left, let me bring this over to Scott. Uh, I'm going to give you the last word as Lawrence O'Donnell says on his show. Uh, Scott, what excites you about the future of AI and zero trust as you work with your companies? I, I have a six-year-old daughter and I hate when she comes back from school and somebody pushed her over like a bully. So I don't like bullies. And I look at these criminal actors and some of the nation state supply chain attacks, which breaking international norms by any stretch of the imagination, I'm pissed. And so what excites me about AI is that it's the, it is the great equalizer for the good guys, because we can put way more resources as good guys towards these problems than the bad guys can. They've got a tremendous number of resources. They work together extremely well. Some say even way better than we do as good guys. But when, that, when we start to actually scale AI properly and we actually get good and put our heads together on this as a human race, we can figure this out. And AI could be the tool that actually, it's, it's a tool, it's not an end state. AI really doesn't mean anything. And, you know, we, we didn't get to have the conversation, John, next time we will, but it's just math. <laughs> and if you use math right. properly, you can scale and you can do awesome things against the bad guy. And that's why I'm excited about AI. I couldn't agree more, Scott. Um, thank you. And John, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a really fun and compelling conversation. And I, it's been my, my great honor and thrill to host both of you guys uh, and, and to have this conversation with everybody. Thank you for your time today. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs>